Hi everyone. In this video, we're going to review some incredibly important theorems. And we can actually think of them all as being sort of generalizations of the fundamental theorem of calculus. So let's start uh, up here and, by reviewing the fundamental theorem of calculus. All right, so one way we could write it is as I have here, where the integral of the derivative of a function is equal to that function uh, or the difference of that function evaluated at our two endpoints. How can we really understand this? So one thing that you want to recall, why, why, like, why does this make any sense, is that what we have here in our integral is equal to df. So df is equal to df dx dx. And remember, we can think of doing as an integral as doing like a continuous sum. So what are we doing? We're really summing over small little infinitesimal changes in f, which of course is then going to be equal to, if you sum over every single little change, the total change in f when you go from a to b. We can also think about this graphically. If I draw, draw, draw some little um, x versus f of x, and we have our little graph f of x. And then what we're doing when we're imagining taking this integral is we're breaking up our function into tiny little dx's. I'm trying to write the, draw these so they're parallel to, or perpendicular to the x-axis, right? So we, have, we consider tiny little dx's. All right, and this is telling us how f is changing in response to an infinitesimal shift in x. And if we go from points a to b, then what we're doing is as we vary x and as we do this integral, we're summing up all of our little infinitesimal changes in f with respect to changing x. All right, so it tells us if we integrate the derivative of a function, we get the difference of that function um, evaluated at the two endpoints. All right, so that's the fundamental theorem of calculus. What we'll see are these different identities that we could consider here, um, where we're considering a fundamental theorem for gradients, a fundamental theorem for divergences, and a fundamental theorem for curls. They're all actually going to have a sort of similar um, form to this, where we are integrating over some derivative on the left-hand side, and then on the right-hand side, we get something which is evaluated just at the boundary, right? So it turns out this integral, right? Notice the right-hand side only cares about the function at the endpoints. It doesn't actually care about anything between those endpoints. It's just the function evaluated at the endpoints. And the same sort of thing is going to hold for these, for these different guys. All right, so uh, let's start by thinking about our fundamental theorem for gradients. So note here that capital T is some scalar field. Oops, that should be a Y, X, Y, and Z. All right, so it's some function of X, Y, and Z. And so what are we doing? We're taking the gradient of T and we're dotting it with a little um, infinitesimal line element. So here we're doing really some line integral and we see that the line integral where we're taking the derivative of our scalar field is again, this, I mean, notice this looks very similar in format, where on the right-hand side, we just have the difference of our scalar field evaluated at our two, at our two endpoints. All right, so again, how can we understand where this comes from? Well, similar to over here, an infinitesimal change in our scalar field is given by this argument of our integral. So this is equal to an infinitesimal change in the scalar field. So in exactly the same way as with the fundamental theorem of calculus, where we're imagining we're adding up all of our changes in the scalar field, and so ultimately, when you do this whole integral from A to B, you end up with the, the scalar field evaluated at B minus the scalar field evaluated at A. Again, if you like, we can draw a little picture. So we have um, our 
our path that goes from A to B. And we have um, our little infinitesimal path elements, DL, go along this path. Right, so these are all going to be tangent to the path, along the path. All right, and I'm not going to go all the way. All right, and so that's what we're imagining we're doing. So again, we're, we're doing some path integral from A to B, where now the dot product here is with some gradient of some scalar field, which I'm not quite sure how to draw this on here. Again, it would just be some, I mean, ultimately, uh, the gradient of T is some vector field, which again, I could draw everywhere if, if I liked. Okay, so a couple important um, things that immediately follow from this that I want to mention. So one, so notice that, again, on the right hand side, this only cares about our scalar field evaluated at points B and points A. It doesn't care the path I took between points B and A. So it turns out this integral from A to B of the gradient of our scale, scalar field, DL, this is path independent. Right, because it's equal to the right hand side here and the right hand side here knows nothing about the path. Right, on the right hand side, I don't have to tell you anything about the particular path I took between A and B. It's always going to be equal to this regardless of the path that I choose to calculate on the left hand side. So what you'll wanna do is you're gonna to wanna to choose a path that's convenient. Um, and because it, it doesn't depend on the path that you choose. The other thing that I wanna mention that also sort of immediately follows is that if we consider doing this over some closed path, remember this is the symbol we will use for a line integral over a closed path of uh, del t dot dl. This is always going to be equal to zero. If we ever do this evaluated over a closed path, why? Because if we look at the right hand side here, this is like t of a minus t of a, right? Because we're starting and ending at the same point if we do a closed path. So this is always going to be equal to zero um, if, if our line integral is over a closed path. Okay, so that's the fundamental theorem for gradients. And we see there are a ton of parallels with, with our standard fundamental theorem of calculus. Things get a little more complicated when we talk about divergences and curls, but I still want to touch on those. So the first thing I want to mention, this fundamental theorem of divergences or of calculus for divergences or whatever you want to call it, uh, actually has many names uh, that might be more familiar to you. And it has many names because this is an incredibly important theorem right here. All right, so this also goes by uh, the divergence theorem. It goes by Green's theorem. And it goes by um, Gauss's theorem. Right, so whenever you hear these names of these theorems, we're really talking about this on the left hand side. Right? And again, it has many names probably because it's just incredibly important in, in physics. All right, so what's going on with this? What do I mean by these symbols? So here on the left-hand side, we're taking a, a volume integral, right? This is an integral over some volume. Uh, maybe I should try to make this more obviously like a capital V or something to differentiate from our vector fields here, right? This is an integral over a volume, right? So remember d tau is our volume element. It's just dx, dy, dz if we're in Cartesian coordinates and it's something more complicated if we're in more complicated co coordinates. All right, so what we're doing is we're taking the volume integral over a divergence, which again is a type of derivative. So again, we're integrating over a derivative and it turns out this is equal to, so this is a surfaced in integral. And remember this symbol is telling us it's a closed surface. 
And what closed surface is this? This is the surface bounding the volume V. Right, so on the left hand side, we have some, some volume integral. On the right hand side, we're doing a surface integral where the particular surface that we're considering is some closed integral bounding this volume of our original uh, vector field V dot DA. All right, so this again, um, the picture you can have in the back of your mind that's going with these. So what, what we've seen with our first two examples here, right again, are that taking an integral over a derivative ends up being equal to our function or our scalar field evaluated only at the endpoints. So this is like it's all of the information is contained at the boundary, which in the case of like a line integral, the boundary are the boundary of a line is is points, right? Here again, we're taking some integral, but now it's a volume integral, right? But again, of a derivative. Um, and again, this is going to be equivalent to taking now, because we're taking a volume integral, what is the boundary of a volume is some surface. So again, all of the information that would be contained in this whole volume on the left-hand side is really just contained on the surface of that volume. All right, so that's the beauty of, of these, different, <laughs> these different theorems. All right, so that is the fundamental theorem for divergences, aka divergence theorem, Green's theorem, Gauss's theorem, whatever you want to call it. All right, and then finally, at the end here, I want to talk about the fundamental theorem for curls. Again, this more often goes by a different name, which is Stokes' theorem. All right. So again, we're following the same pattern where all the information is somehow going to be found on the boundary. Here on the left-hand side, we're doing a surfaced integral. This is, this is S for some surface. We're doing a surface integral over, over uh, the curl. And that's going to be equal to now a line integral over this P here is the perimeter of our surface S. All right, so, so whenever you use this identity, you wanna be sure you have your surface on the left-hand side, and then on your right-hand side, um, the line integral you're doing is over the perimeter of that surface. All right, so there's a couple uh, important things I wanna note. So first notice, if you recall, uh, these surface integrals had a little ambiguity with them. That am ambiguity is the direction associated with our little area our infinitesimal area element, right? It, we knew it was perpendicular to the area, but you know, perpendicular to means there's two different options. Um, so you might wonder, like, is there going to be like some sign difference, like, like this choice that you said I could just make? How can I apply this if I don't know which choice I'm supposed to make? Well, it turns out there is a consistency um, that you can have between the right and left hand sides of this equation. So on the right hand side. There's also a choice that you make, which is the direction of, so we're doing a, a, a integral over a closed path. So we're imagining like some loop. And you can imagine doing that integral clockwise or counterclockwise, right? You can imagine both directions. That would also carry a sign difference. And so there's an ambiguity with sign on both sides that, uh, you know, that you can make consistent by using what is known as the right-hand rule. So use right-hand rule to uh, determine direction of closed path from the direction of dA. Right, so we choose, or you could say, uh, you can find the direction that your DA should be from the direction of your closed path, right? It works both ways. So what we're doing is we're imagining uh, if, if for, a, for instance, 
this is the this is our uh, perimeter of our surface right if we do our integral say in this direction if you curl your fingers along the direction that you're doing the loop your thumb points in the direction right remember our surface is the surface which is bounded by this loop that i just drew and this area vector is going to be either sort of into the loop or out of the loop right it's going to be perpendicular to that surface and by using the right hand rule curling your fingers in the direction that you're doing this closed loop line integral your thumb will point in the direction that would give a consistent direction for for a or for the this infinitesimal area element all right so that's the first important thing i want to mention and then the other thing i just want to mention is similar um we had some things that sort of directly followed some important results for our fundamental theorem of gradients there are also a couple very important things that follow from our fundamental theorem for curls. Um, so the first one, so you might have noticed that, you know, the right hand side again, it only cares, it, it only knows about the perimeter of our surface. It doesn't actually know what our surface was. So you can imagine this loop here that, that I drew here, right? Our surface could just be in the exact plane of this loop or it could sort of be bulging in or in or out of the plane or it could you know the loop could come way out to the other side to where i am and then loop around and it could be a gigantic surface right um, as long as that surface is bounded by this loop our right hand side is going to give the same thing so that means the left hand side which is an integral you know over some surface right that you do have to choose but it, it doesn't actually the result of this calculation is independent of the particular uh, surface right so it, it doesn't depend on the actual surface only the perimeter um, and again, but when you actually do it, if you were to actually do this integral, you would choose some surface. And again, the key here is this is, this should really be thought of as a tool. It means that you should choose if you want to calculate on the left hand side of this, um, you want to choose a surface that's going to be the, the easiest surface, right? The one that makes your life the easiest. Okay. So that's, that's the first point I want to make. The second thing that sort of immediately follows is that if we do our left hand side, but now a closed surface integral of del cross B dot DA, this is going to equal zero. Now, why does this one equal zero? So if we use our identity on the right hand side, so what are we doing? So we're, we're imagining in general, we start with some surface. Now we have a closed surface and we want to consider on the right hand side, we're supposed to consider the boundary of that closed surface. So like a closed surface is like a sphere, but what is the boundary of a sphere? Well, there isn't really one, right? So, so what's happened is your boundary has gone to zero size. So the boundary has gone to zero size. So of course on the right hand side, we're now trying to do some closed integral over some perimeter, but that perimeter has gone to zero size. So the result is going to be zero. So that one also sort of immediately follows, this identity immediately follows from this fundamental theorem. All right, so these are incredibly important theorems, which again, we can think of these as all sort of generalizations of some fundamental theorem of calculus, where you're doing some integral of, of a derivative, and we see that that only depends on, on some boundary information, whether that be, you know, points or, or uh, surfaces or, or lines, right? Those are all different types of boundaries, and all of the information is stored there.
And these are going to be like very, very important in physics. All right, thank you.